and we're going to hope for the best. If you are watching it slash listening to it on another screen, um, just be sure to mute it on Facebook because otherwise you hear yourself about three times in your headphones. Okay, I think we're live. It says we're live. Um, if there's anyone watching, I know we're a couple of minutes early that can actually confirm that we are live. That would be amazing. In the meantime, I'm just going to fill this space with um, just some general yibba yabba um, until someone confirms that we are live because I don't want to kickstart unless some people are here. Yes, thank you um, very much for confirming that we are live. Um, so welcome to um, our Facebook Live event and thank you so much for spending your um, either your Friday night or your Friday morning or your Saturday morning um, with us um, for how to save a life, um, focusing on the implementation of the Recover um, Veterinary CPR guidelines within practice. So as an introduction, I am Amelia Paul. I'm an RVN and Project Officer for Quality Improvement at RCVS Knowledge. And our mission is to advance the quality of veterinary care for the benefit of animals, the public and society. RCVS Knowledge are the charity partner of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons in the UK. And although we have RCVS in our name, we are a separate organisation. Um, sorry, I got sidetracked because I just saw someone's checking in from Botswana. Hi. Um, sorry, that's made me very excited. <laughs> so what does, well, what does that all mean to you and this session? Um, so RCVS Knowledge champion an evidence-based approach to veterinary medicine through our library and information services, our free journal Watch in Focus, and our free to publish and free to view journal Veterinary Evidence. This makes primary and secondary evidence accessible to the veterinary professions. So we are, a, we are a great place to come if you're interested in creating your own evidence-based guidelines. We also run a campaign to promote quality improvement in veterinary practice, providing a growing number of resources, tools, and courses to provide a structure for veterinary teams to put the evidence into a format that can be used at the point of care. If you're a history buff, then we are custodians of the RCVS Historical Archives, where you can browse highlights of 500 years of veterinary history through our Vet History digital collections. In the first of our two-part series, which is available on our Facebook page and our website, the co-chairs of Recover spoke about the available training schemes, which you can see more about on the Recover website. We also discussed how the Recover team have applied evidence-based theory to create the guidelines. Evidence-based theory is about using the most relevant and best available evidence combined with clinical expertise, patient circumstances and owner's values. In veterinary medicine, we often have challenges around available high quality evidence. And I would encourage anyone who's interested in creating guidelines to listen back to this first session and hear how Recover managed the evidence gaps. So in this session, we will be discussing how the guidelines are being used in practice. Um, this will be a very um, informal discussion and sorry, totally sidetracked by the amount of people saying where they're from, I love it. Um, so it's an informal discussion. Please comment, please chat, please um, just keep on talking um, in the groups. That would be amazing. Um, so to introduce, firstly, we are joined by Dan Fletcher, Recover Initiative Co-Chair. Dan has been on the faculty of the Cornell University College of Veterinary Medicine since 2006. He has received multiple teaching awards and has been building simulators for veterinary education since 2009, opening the Tetlow and Roy Park Innovation Lab, an immersive simulation centre at Cornell in 2015. Um, Ken Yagi is a veterinary technician specialist in emergency and critical care and has been the program director for the Recover Initiative since 2017, developing the certification process and international instructor network to establish an evidence-based standard for veterinary CPR worldwide. Ken is currently employed at the Park Innovation Lab at Cornell as the veterinary education simulation laboratory manager. 
And last but not least, we are joined by Rachel Marshall, who is the Head of Clinical Nursing at Vets Now and Certified Recover Instructor. She has previously worked previously in emergency and critical care and as a lecturer in veterinary nursing and animal management. Um, so hello to all of you. Thank you so much for um, joining me. Um, and as I said before, we are going to talk about kind of the recover guidelines and how we implement them in practice to benefit our patients. Um, so I'm going to initially hand over to um, Rachel, just to give me a quick intro kind of on on how on how you've done it while I go through some of the comments and um, see everyone. <laughs> Thank you and hi to everyone. Um, so as Amelia said, I work at Vets now. Um, so what we have always had is we've had CPR within our training that we deliver routinely to the clinic. So every two years we delivered CPR training because it is an aspect that we have to do quite a lot in emergency medicine. And as well as the two years where we deliver usually theoretical training, we also do six monthly practicals which varied as how we did them. So usually it would be at staff meetings that they'd have a practice and uh, go through that, that, or there'd be the odd occasion where somebody just threw the resussy dummy into the room and shouted crash to see what happened that way. So we didn't have really a formal structure. Um, quite a few of us over the years have done the recovery training um, and had been certified, but we decided that we needed to kind of step it and make it more of a structured programme. So at the end of February, beginning of March, um, 26 of us completed the online bit and then Ken uh, and Dan came across and certified us all and trained us all to be instructors using the simulator, which was fantastic. Um, so the plan from there was to go out to the clinics and get um, a vet and nurse certified in every clinic and then offer the online training to everyone else uh, within the clinics. And we would aim to train sort of animal care assistants and receptionists as part of that, just because we have smaller teams. So we need as many people uh, as possible. Obviously it's 2020 and it's COVID. So that has kind of slowed us down a little bit um, just because as with everybody, I imagine it all got very hectic and got very busy. So we're just getting ourselves back into a place now where we're starting to look at this and we're just starting, uh, we'll be starting to roll this out to the clinic. So that's kind of where we are at the moment. That's, um, sorry, I, again, com getting completely sidetracked by the amount of people. Thank you everyone joining us from all over. Um, it really is amazing. Um, so Rachel's given us a bit of an intro, intro on um, how vets, vets now have have kind of done it and I must admit it's probably similar with a lot of other emergency places within the within the UK um, trying to train kind of everyone on the team because there's quite often small teams kind of working through the night in emergencies. Um, does that differ a bit in the states like do you have bigger teams um, how I don't know how how would you say that differs in kind of your hospitals um, over in the in the US. I, I'm happy to comment on that. <laughs> um, sorry. sorry. Uh, I think, um, I guess, I guess a couple of points I would want to make right now. So we're talking about um, sort of 24 hour emergency practices. I would argue that that, that is important um, that people in 24 hour emergency mm -hmm. practices know how to do CPR, but I don't think it's just an emergency practice um, uh, skill. So I do think it's important for those of you who are listening to this right now um, that you understand that if you're working in more of a general practice setting where you're doing elective procedures, um, minor surgeries, major surgeries, uh, but more of an elective day kind of practice, it's still important for you to know how to do CPR. And I would argue um, that you are the folks who have the best opportunity to actually save some of these lives because if you're dealing with an arrest, um, I'm sure most of you have, it's an acute, probably reversible condition, maybe associated with anesthesia. And those are the ones that have the best prognosis. So people like us who work in specialty practice or emergency practice that are seeing very sick patients, um, we probably have less of an opportunity to get these patients back than you do. So um, I think it's really important to remember that, that this is a skill that everyone should know who's a veterinary health pr uh, professional. Um, and I think people in different practice settings have a really great opportunity to, to catch these cases and to actually turn them around probably much more than I can. I think in terms of specialty practice, um, I think we've had really good buy-in in the United States. 
um, uh, of the recovery guidelines and of recovery training in our 24 hour emergency and specialty practices. Um, and that's been really gratifying to see where I think we're still working very hard and trying to, um, to get some inroads is in the more general practice setting. And again, that's a, a bit of a crusade for me because they're the folks who have the best chance of saving mm -hmm. these lives yeah. um, because those patients aren't quite as sick as the ones I'm dealing with. Um, so I think that, um, you know, CPR is a team sport, but it can be done with a team as small as two. And uh, you can do very effective CPR with a very small team. So I think it is important that everyone understand the best possible way to do CPR. And I would argue the recovery guidelines are the best we've got right now in veterinary medicine uh, because they are truly evidence based. And I think um, I was literally going to go on to the topic of um, kind of the initial implementation of guidelines um, within a practice that may not have had any CPR guidelines before. Um, perhaps they've had a significant event where they either lost a patient or got a patient back and that's kind of spurred them on to think about yeah. putting something um, more in place. Um, and I was thinking about my own kind of experience of probably most times I've had to use CPR are during the day in kind of nine to five practice yeah. um which you know you wouldn't expect but it's such a useful skill um so if a practice was literally starting afresh like they want to introduce guidelines within the practice they've got a fairly sizable sizable team um what would you suggest kind of the initial implementation of the guidelines kind of should be if they haven't had anything particular set in place beforehand? Yeah, I think step one is to read them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so the, the guideline, um, the guidelines are available to anybody who wants to read them for free download from the Journal of Veterinary Emergency and Critical Care. Um, it's an open access issue. Um, they were published back in 2012, which um, is a fair fair time ago, but I think they're still the most standard and current guidelines we have. So I think step one is to read them um, and to encourage your staff to read them. That, that issue can be a little daunting because it's got seven manuscripts in it. Um, the important one um, from a practice standpoint is the seventh one, the last one in the journal, not because I'm the first author of it, but because it's the, <laughs> uh, it's the one where we actually distill down um, the guidelines and go through the algorithm. So I think learning that first and making sure that you're comfortable with the, the major aspects of the guidelines is, is important and you can get that from the manuscript. Having the algorithm there in your practice and posted on the wall is really helpful, but it doesn't help if people haven't learned it first. So just having a piece of paper or a poster up on the wall that has a whole bunch of stuff on it, if it's a crisis, no one's gonna be looking at that. So it's meant to be a cognitive aid to help remind you and it's a good way for people to refresh by looking at it. But I think um, spending some time with basic life support, so really the most important part of CPR, chest compressions and ventilation and making sure you know how to do them. So lots of people think they know how to do um, basic life support, but if you look at the data that, um, that we have published now and the most recent data is just from a couple of years ago now, um, the, the majority of people don't know the basics of basic life support as veterinary healthcare professionals, that you're supposed to do compressions at 100 to 120 per minute, that you're supposed to breathe 10 times um, a minute. People don't, don't know that. Um, they, don't, they, mm -hmm. they learned maybe how to do it when they were back in veterinary school or nursing school, but they haven't been refreshed on it because we don't have mandatory training. So just if you, if you nothing else, if you just get basic life support down, knowing how fast and how deep to compress and knowing how to ventilate, you're going to get a lot of patients back if it's an acute reversible problem like a perianesthetic arrest just by learning that. And that doesn't take a whole lot of fancy stuff. Of course, what I would love to see um, would be that everyone do the certification process. So we have an online certification process that you can start with uh, where you can learn the guidelines and in an interactive online course. And then you can take a, um, an in-person training on top of that and, and uh, really practice those skills. At a minimum, doing the online course really does give you a good overview of all of the guidelines and gives you an opportunity to practice them, at least the cognitive aspects of them. So I think minimal thing you can do, read the guidelines, talk through the algorithm and post that algorithm in your practice and, let, and make sure that everyone is comfortable with that. Um, next step would be to do the online certification. And then if you're very, very ex excited and eager to get everyone up to speed, then um, doing the in-person certification, I think, is a, is a really great next step that can really solidify that for your whole team and also learn a little bit more about how to work as a team in a crisis. Yeah. I think CPR is something um, from 
helping to train student vet nurses um, in practice is kind of something that just scares the poop out of everyone. Um, I have to be very careful not to say the other word then. Um, so um, as you say, just complete preparation. And Rachel did kind of touch a little bit on simulation before, but um, a lot of the simulation, especially in practices that I've worked at is, oh, it's a quiet afternoon. Um, quick, we'll run in with like a soft toy dog and mm -hmm. pretend it's dying, but nobody really takes it overly seriously. And I think practicing on that sort of thing is, I don't know, I always found hard because it's a lot more tiring doing chest compressions than on <laughs> Than on a soft toy on a real dog um so would you kind of recommend simulation training um as a regular for people in practice just to keep their skills up or is there a certain almost like is there a certain like a best way best way to do it if that makes sense yeah i mean we have a whole section in the guidelines about this about this the prevention and preparedness section and um, a lot of information about training and we're we're in the process of revising those and so we're looking at the most current literature I don't think you need a fancy simulator, um, and I, I don't think that should be a barrier to anyone um, because I, I think you, again, basic life support is the most important part of this. And with a stuffed dog, um, and maybe just put a little, um, you know, a little foam football inside of it or something so you get a little bit of recoil. Or honestly, at the end of the day, there's some nice studies in human medicine showing if you take a two liter bottle, empty it out, um, screw the cap on nice and tight and then do compressions on that, you'll get some recoil from that. And that type of practice can, can go a long way, right? Just getting comfortable. And I think you, you really hit the nail on the head. It's about being comfortable trying. I think that what prevents people from intervening and having success is it just scares them um, because they're not comfortable with it. So just getting yourself to the point where you're comfortable with basic life support and you, you have in your head what the steps are can go a long way. Now, if you're in a fancy practice um, and you have the ability to have a simulator, obviously that's great because you can really practice putting all the pieces together in a real, really realistic environment, but that's not required. Um, and I think that you can learn to do really excellent CPR with a two liter soda bottle. You know, like there's a lot that you can do um, with, with not a lot of equipment. I absolutely 100% love that idea. I've literally just written down two little two liter bottle and a soft toy dog. Um, we see, I'm, you know, not trying to advertise here, but I find the best soft toy dogs are the ones from Ikea because they've got mouths mm -hmm. that open and you can put ET tubes down them. But yep. I never thought of putting a two liter bottle down. Um, and I know a lot of the nurses listening will absolutely love that. And to be honest, IKEA is probably going to be rammed tomorrow and um, Asda as well, just to get some bottles. It's funny um, you should bring that up because we don't have an IKEA here in Ithaca. And I was um, I was out of town in a larger city not so long ago, and I stopped by the IKEA and bought um, bought a, one of those dogs because we don't have very many around here, and I wanted to have some more of them to play with. Um, and last night, a friend was over with her dog, and her dog um, almost shredded the IKEA dog, which upset me very much. <laughs> But happily, they are very cheap, and I think they could be very good models. So, yeah, absolutely. I think there's a reason why they've continued selling a particular um, soft toy <laughs> dog for at least the last 20 years is because the veterinary profession is absolutely <laughs> keeping it going. <laughs> um, so I love the idea of um, simulations. I just I always did find it quite hard to, I don't know, get people to take it seriously. Um, do you have any tips on kind of how to get people to take it seriously when it's obvious it's not really a, a dying animal in front of you? I think for any time you're training in simulation, I think um, it's setting the stage and letting people understand what the point of it is can go a very long way um, towards engagement. So it's interesting because I've, I've actually attended quite a few workshops on how to do simulation training, mostly um, from human medical professionals. And they always have a section at all of those trainings about what to do with the disengaged learner, how to handle those, those learners who are not getting into this whole process. And I have to say, I, it hasn't been my experience ever um, in the training that I've done, which has been all over the world, um, that veterinary professionals disengage from this type of training, probably just because they haven't had that much experience with it. So it's still interesting and new. But I think that the important part to make it work is to have a discussion beforehand about why you're doing this. So that pre-brief that you do before you start the training where you're explaining, you know, what is the point of this? Why is this important? Why, why do we need to learn this? And how is playing with this stuffed dog 
going to make you better for the patients that you're seeing later. So I think if you can set that stage, and then I think also open the door and make it make it clear to them that it's okay to laugh. It's okay to look at this as being kind of funny because you're basically pounding on the chest of a stuffed dog or cat. It's it's a it's a weird thing, right? It's a very strange thing. So I think. <laughs> acknowledging that and making it clear that it's okay to laugh a little bit, but then we need to also make sure that we have these skills and we have to set the stage for why those skills are important. Um, and I think if you can sort of set that stage a little bit, if you can just take a, like a minute or two beforehand to just go through that with everyone and make sure they understand why they're there in the first place and why we're doing this, I think it goes a long way toward helping them to engage and also giving them that, that freedom to have that pop off valve, to have that, you know, to go through a, a scenario. And then it's okay to take a few minutes to laugh about what happened and laugh about those, the strange things that happened during the course of doing it. That's fine. Uh, but always bringing it back to the fact that we're doing this to try to learn from it. And then I think the other, the other really important thing that I'll throw out there for people who maybe don't do this very often is you have many opportunities when an event like this happens in the, in the clinic to learn from it. And if you can, can really make yourself at, after every arrest situation, even just any kind of emergency situation where the team had to work together to solve a problem. If you can take just a few minutes to debrief after that, um, I'm not talking about a 20 minute go to the, you know, go to the conference room and, and take everybody off the floor, but a two to three minute conversation, what went well, what do we think could go better next time and what things could we change in the practice setting that would make us more effective next time turns that even if it was a bad outcome, turns it into a positive because it, it allows everyone to grow and mm -hmm. to strategize and to contribute to how can we do this better the next time. So I really would encourage people to take that time. I think we, um, you know, uh, cardiopulmonary arrest does not have a great success rate overall. And especially if you are one of those people who's practicing in an emergency or a specialty center, you're often doing CPR on patients that you know the prognosis is terrible for and that you know you're not likely to get back. Um, and so taking that few minutes afterwards to talk through it so that people feel like they learn something from it can take that negative and flip it around into a positive that actually makes them more engaged and makes them more optimistic the next time one of these occurs. And I think acknowledging during that debrief that, you know, this was a case that we weren't going to get back, but you know what? We did it. We learned from it. And we gave the client the closure and, the, and, and that, you know, that feeling that they did everything they could, even though we knew this wasn't going to go well it was meaningful to the client, it didn't hurt the patient, and we learned something from it. So think about all those positive things that come out of it so that the next time when we have a patient that actually does have a good chance, we're better and we can do even better then and we can get that one back. Hmm. And I think, sorry, Ken, tie, go ahead. Tied a little bit to the um, what Dr. Fletcher just said in terms of why this training is important and um, some of the feelings that we have after um, something happens, uh, or the CPR happens. Um, I come from a, before I came to Cornell, I came from a 24 seven general slash emergency practice. And so we did a lot of um, uh, non-emergency and critical care uh, related cases as well. And so um, whatever the situation is, uh, depending on the shift that we were on, the doctor that was there, the people that came to respond to the code, CPR would sometimes go really, really well because we know each other, it's a small group of people and, and we know exactly what we're doing and things went well and we could walk away feeling like we did the best that we can. Sometimes it would be a group of people who don't normally work with each other or maybe they have different thoughts on CPR and so then uh, CPR wouldn't go so well. And then th these are the cases where we feel like, wow, that, that, was a, that was a mess. And I think that's where the debriefing and things like that is going to be really important. But another aspect of this training that we really should be thinking about is how are our team members feeling while they're performing CPR and afterwards. Part of that can be taken care of by the debriefing, but the general sense of the, um, the fact that maybe we didn't do the best for the patient, we felt helpless in the situation, we thought something else should have been done, but we couldn't voice that or we voiced it, but somebody like somebody overrode that and you know they didn't listen to it. There's different kinds of conflicts that could arise while performing CPR that leads us to feel helpless and frustrated walking away. And we lost a patient. And so by being able to implement something like recover CPR or some kind of a some kind of standardized protocol in which everyone performs CPR on, at least that part of the frustration should go away. Everyone should know how to perform CPR the same way and have the same understanding so that 
we could truly walk away from it believing that um, we gave this patient the best chance. And I think that's part of the reason why when I heard Dr. Fletcher talk about the recovery guideline process back in 2012, you came in, you went and uh, presented on that. Then when I heard that at the Evidence-Based Medicine uh, Association Symposium, I turned to Dr. McKenzie um, and said like, wow, like we have to take this back to Adobe and make this happen. And that's how my road to the recovery guidelines started. Um, so, so I think that uh, again, just tying it back to the why this training is important. If anyone feels like it's silly and they don't want to participate, that kind of feeling um, where things didn't go so well, I think every one of us who have been in some kind of emergency situation can relate to that. And so I think it'll become more relevant to them if we can share that kind of um, uh, experience that we may have had around CPR. Sorry, I thought I'm... <laughs> I thought you were looking to unmute Rachel. That's why I paused. Um, I was, I was going to say how, apart from ensuring that the guidelines are there, how do you get around kind of if you've got a team that changes all the time and they don't know each other and they don't kind of have that chemistry? Obviously, when you have chemistry with a team and you bounce well off each other, I, you know, you feel like things have gone gone smoother, even if they don't. If you've got a team where, say, you have a lot of locums in or they constantly switch around and they don't know each other that well, how would you, I don't, it's hard to get my question out. Sorry, I'm trying to ask a question and I don't even know how to, how to ask it. Um, are there any yeah, situations? How to, how to prepare for that, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm glad you're speaking English today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm clearly not, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, that was honestly the, one of the primary motivations for one of the modules in the online basic life support course. Um, it's the last module in the course, and it's one on team communication. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, so it's a whole hour module that um, talks about some ways that teams can communicate well, even if they don't know each other very well. Um, and probably even most importantly, even if they don't like each other very much. So I, I talk about team training quite a bit, and I, I try to make it very clear that you don't have to like everybody on the team to work effectively as a team. So if you can um, sort of agree to abide by some ground rules around team communication and team dynamics, um, you can actually be quite effective even with a group of people who aren't necessarily your best friends. So I think, um, I think that's gotta be part of the, part of the practice culture, this, this um, approach to how we communicate with each other, especially in a crisis and maybe mm. using some standardized approaches to that. So that does require that everyone buy in and everyone be trained. Uh, but I, I think that is honestly of, of all of the parts of that course, it's one of the ones that I'm most proud of because I think it's something that in veterinary medicine, we've been a bit behind in. Um, there's mm. a huge uh, um, body of literature and um, very well-established team communication training in human medicine and has been for you know decades now. And we don't really, we haven't ever really done very much of that in veterinary medicine. So I think we, we leaned very heavily into the what's available in human medicine and the parts of that course um, that, that are available for anybody who wants to take it are, are very much based on team steps, which is a sort of a standardized approach to, to healthcare communication from human medicine that's very evidence-based. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think that is key if you've got teams that are shifting a lot and people who are working different shifts at different times. Locums are a whole different issue because if they come in and they haven't been trained, it can be a little bit challenging. But if the rest of the team is communicating mm -hmm. really well, I don't think it takes long for the person who hasn't had that training to figure out what's going on and to jump in and start communicating in the same way. So just simple things like closed loop communication where when you want something, you direct it specifically at a person and that person repeats it back to you so that there's no question that they heard what you said and they understood it. Once you're in a room and you see that happening a few times, you pretty quickly realize, oh, well, that's the way that works here. So I guess I'll do the same thing. Um, so yeah. I, I think all of these tools are very, very simple little things, uh, but they can really go a long way towards avoiding errors and then allowing people to to really understand what's happening um, and, and, um, and stay in the loop. And then I think the other piece that, um, that I would throw in is just um, the idea of leading a CPR team. And we talk about this a lot in the course that the team leader, it doesn't have to make all the decisions and in fact shouldn't be making all the decisions. The team leader should be organizing the team, 
should be actively soliciting input from the team, should be asking the team to, to explain what they think is going on and making sure that they're on the same page so that everybody can contribute to making the decisions that need to be made. And that is very possible to do effectively and efficiently, even in a crisis situation like CPR, you know, as long as everybody is sort of in that rhythm and has that expectation that they're supposed to contribute and participate, it, it really makes a huge difference. And it, it means that it takes the pressure off of any one individual and it lets mm -hmm. the team really function well. So I think even if someone is coming in from outside, that's something that they pick up quickly because they see that, that interchange happening people are talking back and forth and are all participating and then it becomes you know an expectation that 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 everyone is engaged and i'll um add that um even through the recovery certification training that we've been able to put on one of the common comments that i hear is that this group of people from this particular practice got the training and so they know how the recovery guideline is set up and how recovery CPR is supposed to be performed, but they could go back to their practice and then still run into people who don't know the recovery guideline very well, so then it, they still don't work very well as a team. And so um, I think that um, uh, establishing a CPR protocol within the practice is very important that everyone agrees to use. Um, and it's very easy to adapt the recovery guideline into a protocol. When we did our training, um, initial training uh, where I used to work, this was before the certifications were out there. And so what we had to do was we had to take the guideline and then adapt it into a hospital protocol because you can't just drop the guideline and say, here, this is how we're gonna perform CPR. There's a lot of different details related to how the CPR is performed within your own practice that you need to decide as well. How is a code called? How do you, what kinds of roles are we assigning? And once the roles are assigned, how do we signal people that we don't need any more help? You know, there's different kinds of details that we would look at. Um, and so once a protocol is established and, um, adopted by the practice as something that everyone else is going to follow. And one of them, um, what we implemented was uh, what Dr. Fletcher just mentioned in terms of uh, CPR leaders that we're going to establish a CPR leader. This is how they're going to declare themselves a leader. And anyone who comes on scene afterwards will check to see if there's a leader, you know, uh, so that we don't have more leaders trying to come in. And um, and so by being able to establish a written protocol that was distributed to the entire practice saying that this is how we're going to perform CPR according to the recovery guideline, here's some areas that we can't really strictly follow because of these reasons, um, whatever you know, uh, qualifiers you need to put on there will make it more likely that even if, the, if all your staff members aren't certified, there's probably at least a very good common understanding on how it'll be performed. I think, yeah, I agree both with what Ken and Dan said. I think the other thing from my experience, I'd say is you quickly need to establish if you've got locums, what the experience is when it happens. I think it's the automatic hierarchical thing is that the nurse and the ACAS may look to the vet. And if the vet's the locum that's not done the training, doesn't necessarily need to be the vet that is the leader. If the nurses are trained, if the nurses know the protocol, they can take over the leader to try and get up that speed. So I think you have to be quite quick at working out who knows what and don't just stand looking at somebody. If you can see they're struggling and you know the answer, you need to speak up. Yeah. And again, if you see things that aren't quite right, everybody should be able to speak up and say their bit. And obviously we're in a polite way, but sometimes quite quick way. <laughs> Yeah, it was right, actually right one turn. of the questions. <laughs> yeah. it's, one, it's, it's one of the questions that we actually answered in the last round of guidelines, um, which is who should who should um, be the team leader? Um, and the answer is the person with the most experience and the most training in CPR, and that may or may not be the, the doctor in the room. It may be the nurse in the room. Mm -hmm. um, there are some really interesting studies that I like to cite when I talk to the nurses and the doctors about this, um, that you know, where they take, most of them are from human medicine where they had paramedics who were in ambulances um, and they would compare their success rates with CPR when they were um, just the paramedics were there or when the paramedics were there with a physician. And it turned out that their success rates are better when the physician wasn't there uh, because they knew how to do CPR better than the physicians did. But when the physicians were there, they would take over and they would try to lead the code and they weren't as skilled. And this is 
a really important part of the evidence base that sort of leads to this recommendation that, that it shouldn't necessarily just be the most senior person or the person with the most letters after you know her name. It should be the, the person who actually knows how to do CPR. On kind of a flip side, I think it's also important. We have um, a lot of obviously trainees and students um, watching, and I think it's also absolutely okay that if you know CPR is required just if you're not confident to say oh <laughs> I don't know how to do this um because it would be better that everyone knows than you absolutely thrown in the deep end and expected kind of how to do that so um kind of shouting up when you do know the guidelines and what to do and also just completely shouting up when you don't know or you're not feeling confident um or especially you know if you're giving chest compressions and actually after 20 seconds you just feel like you literally can't go on anymore um i think pointing kind of pointing that out is really important as well you don't have to i don't know continue beyond your means um, I have had a couple of questions um, come through. Sorry, I've been trying to collect them um, for a while. Um, so Chloe says, um, do you have any advice on using recently deceased animals for CPR simulations? Um, is it suitable um, if you get a signed copy kind of before PTS? Would that be a suitable simulation? Has anyone ever done that before? Um, I, I guess I could um, mention that uh, with the training that we did, um, we've had uh, mannequins that we've used. And um, on a occasion, we did use um, a cada cadaver because we did some training that used uh, you know, cadavers. We definitely get permission. You know, obviously, you have to um, make sure that you do that properly. Um, but uh, in terms of CPR training, I, I don't think there's a huge benefit to using actual um, animals uh, to be do, doing that um, uh, CPR training itself. Um, a lot of the skills, like uh, I, I think that actually um, the simulators uh, that we have at Cornell here and we use for the, the CPR training is probably better than that situation because it can simulate so many more different things as though it's an actual patient. Um, so you don't get a whole lot of that. So in terms of uh, a, a model that, that you would be able to intubate, maybe intubation is more realistic with a cadaver, sure. Um, you know, but compression wise, yeah, it might feel, it will feel more like a actual animal versus what a mannequin feels like, but do we gain a whole lot from that? Um, I, I, I don't know it, if it, I would not go and seek out cadavers to do CPR training with, if that makes sense. But other people may have different opinions, so. I guess you'd certainly have to weigh up um, what the owner um, was like in regards to kind of asking suitability for that sort of thing, like what benefits you would get from it as a team um, versus how the owners kind of likely to react. I think there wouldn't be a lot of owners that you could just kind of broach that subject to. Um, yeah, I think I think it probably also depends on the goal. You know, what are you trying to teach? Hmm. Um, I think I think for the most part, CPR training um, when you're doing hands-on CPR training, it's trying to get people comfortable with the decision making and recognizing how long it takes to do something. So putting it all together. Um, so I, I do, I think in terms of the quality of what it feels like to do chest compressions, I'm sure you guys all know that every patient is very different from every other patient. You know, you have two Labradors laying on tables next to you and, and one of them is 12 years old and one of them is two years old. What those chest compressions feel like is going to be completely different between those two patients. Um, the, the chest compliance is going to change over time and all of that. So I think in terms of fidelity for training, if that's the reason for wanting to use a cadaver, I guess I'm not 100% sure that it adds anything because every patient is gonna feel different. I think it's just yeah. different than in people where we're all kind of shaped similarly because we treat dogs and cats. They're, we have this huge range of different size of animal that we work with. So I don't know that that fidelity is worth, um, is worth, I guess, I, I don't wanna, the, the issue that I see with doing that is, um, when you're doing, when you're practicing CPR and practicing chest impressions on that silly stuffed Ikea dog, 
there's no emotional connection to that. There's no, it's, it's just the silly stuff like he a dog and you're, and you're sort of focusing on the decisions you're making when it's a real animal, especially if it's one that you've worked with and you know, if it's, if it's not a real attempt at CPR, I could see that for some members of the team that might be a little distressing, um, especially if it's, you know, again, a patient that they were treating and who's now been euthanized. So I, I guess I would just be cautious about that mm -hmm. and just make sure that it doesn't have a negative impact on the team because of that connection. I think it's very different to do CPR when your goal is to get that patient back than it is for practice. Um, so we just have to be yeah. cautious, I guess. One thing that popped in my head is that I guess one potential benefit of doing them on cadavers is um, the different shapes of dogs. So um, bulldogs and things like that, that's so hard to I don't know stimulate with soft toys because they are so soft <laughs> um so kind of practicing on those sort of barrel chested shapes um may potentially be beneficial um but again for all of the other reasons I'm also not a hundred percent sure if there's any legality um this question came from the UK um I know generally kind of a signed copy of things, but I would definitely want to look into um, kind of the legality of that because obviously a body tends to belong to the owner um, afterwards. So whether a signed copy would be enough, um, I'm sure that would be something to absolutely double check with the um, laws around the company there. Um, so I'm just going through these other questions as well. Um, with the um, recover courses, do you have a lot of um, vet students that sign on? Is it is it different for vet students um, to go through it, or would you recommend that they be qualified beforehand? Um, we have a lot of vet students who take the course, and actually during COVID, we um, we had a special program where any vet student or veterinary technology slash nursing student in the world who wanted to could take the courses for free. And we had a lot who did. Can you, and I don't know the actual total number that we wound up um, having. 18,500 students. Which is really exciting. So um, yeah, wow. 18,500 18, students around the world um, took the courses. And uh, we here at Cornell, all of our students take the course, the online course during their third year of the curriculum. Some take it earlier if they're acting as um, veterinary nurses in the hospital, they'll take the course a little earlier, but um, but all of them take it during their third year and then we do a certification lab with them. So it's definitely, I think, very appropriate for veterinary students and, and veterinary um, nursing students as well. So I definitely encourage them. So the, um, for those of you who haven't looked at it, if you go to the website, the, um, the the price for veterinary nurses and for students is less than the price for um, for um, uh, uh, doctors, whatever I am, <laughs> that thing I am uh, for veterinarians. Um, so there's a, a adjusted pricing structure, but it's the exact same course. It's just less expensive for other folks. Yeah. So we just had one more question come in, um, which I believe is answered um, within the recover guidelines, but they're asking about um, the number of chest compressions um, that you mentioned earlier, would that be different for neonatal um, to that of an adult? I know that neonatal is something that's coming up in the next set um, of kind of guidelines as well. Um, but is that answered within the guidelines now? I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, I'm not expecting you to, you know, just yeah, reel it off. Yeah, it's not. Um, <laughs> so that was the main reason we added a, we're calling it a newborn domain. It's interesting. One of the one of the first issues we had when we decided to launch this new domain was, um, what is the correct terminology and what do you call these creatures? So um, newborns um, are the ones that we're focusing on. I saw there was a, a statement that popped up about a 48 hour old puppy that um, that uh, this person had done CPR on and it was very hard to lose some an animal that young and I completely agree so our current guidelines we um, are really focused on adult um, dogs and cats um, so you'll have to be a little bit patient with us um, because I think the questions will be the answers will be very different I think for newborns and uh, I think there are a lot of um, there are a lot of 
consensus kind of guidelines out there about about the approach in newborns. Most of us use the same approach right now, but certainly in human medicine, there are some significant differences, especially in the way basic life support is done uh, if, if you can't intubate them. Um, so the compression ventilation ratios and things like that. And those are questions that we're answering. And right now we're in the process. We have 28 individual questions in the newborn domain um, and they're all currently undergoing the evidence evaluation. Um, so stay tuned um, that our plan is to have a completely separate algorithm for the newborn domain um, that will hopefully summarize all of the things that we figure out um, as we as we do this investigation. So. So stay tuned. I wish I could tell you I know, but I don't right now know what the best choices are for yeah. um, for the newborn. <laughs> um, and another question that has come up relatively frequently, especially um, before this session is, um, and as you have answered before, is obviously performing um, CPR when you are only part of a one person or two person team. Um, and as you say, out of everything, it's the basic life support that is more important. Um, and you know, even if there's only one of you um, in the building, chest compressions and yeah. So we we do in the course and in the guidelines, we have information about what to do if you're by yourself, which is basically chest compressions and mouth to snout ventilation. I wouldn't be trying to intubate a patient while you're doing chest compressions. That probably isn't going to go very well. But um, but I would be calling for help. Um, you need someone else there to give you a hand. But in the short term. Yeah, it's 30 chest compressions, two quick breaths, and then immediately back to chest compressions. And I would just keep doing that until either you get the patient back or someone comes to help you and you can jump into the next step. I with will two never people, you, yeah, with Sorry, two people, you ahead. can do pretty much everything. <laughs> so um, so I would uh, I would argue that with two, with two folks, one person is compressing, uh, the other person is intubating and starts ventilating. And then you only you have six seconds between every breath and you can do a lot in six seconds so you can deliver a breath run to the crash cart get your drugs out run back give your breath run back to the crash cart start to draw up your drugs um so with two of you you can actually do quite a bit of advanced life support yeah i will um never forget a patient that i had who it was the same i was alone he was a greyhound he crashed and in that six seconds it was opening the door and literally screaming <laughs> for, yeah. for help um <laughs> which was fine by the time people came, I managed to get him round, in fact, some sort of miracle. Um, and unfortunately, as I turned around to update everyone, I knocked a bottle of disinfectant off and it hit him on the head. And ever since then, he has been highly aggressive towards me. Um, so I think it's also important to know that you may get these patients back, but you may not get any, any appreciation for it um, ever. Um, but yeah, as you say, in those six seconds, you can really you can really do a lot and you can shout for a lot of help you can give breaths um and as ken said about especially practice protocols making them taking the recover guidelines and making them work for your practice especially the layout of your practice um i've worked in some hospitals where the kennels were kind of a little bit away from each other and um, there was no kind of connection to oxygen, so we made sure that we had ambibads and emergency drugs like in a specific box. And it's looking at your practice and seeing what works and what doesn't work. And ideally, um, what, you know, what you can do to offer the best life support that you can. Um, we're getting a lot of questions about when, when the expected release date of the newborn protocol is. Um, this was answered in the last Facebook Live, but we are fingers crossed hoping for 2021. Is that is that right? It better be 2021. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't take much more of it, but um, but no, we're we're full steam ahead right now. We have uh, we have as of today 82 questions um, that are in the system and, and being worked on. Um, we're targeting about 100 and about 140 probably total is how many we'll we'll do at the end of the day. So um, the newborn questions are all um, in process. So um, I am anticipating those being done um, definitely in time. So our plan is hopefully to be presenting the new guidelines at IVEX in 2021. So that would be September of 2021 uh, with publication in the fall. That's that's the current hope for all of the new guidelines. I saw there were some questions about other species as well. So since I'm blabbering on again I'll, I'll throw out my answers to that um, yeah. so we do have a large animal domain this time around um, so there we are asking questions about both neonates like, so foals 
um, calves, creas, those kinds of things, as well as adult large animals. Um, we have a group of very enthusiastic large animal um, criticalists and internists um, and surgeons who are helping us with this. So we're very excited that we will have a large animal domain this time. I think we have 40 or so questions, um, many of them in parallel with the small animal questions. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's going to be exciting. And then exotics comes up a lot. Um, the problem with exotics is it's not one species. <laughs> it's, um, it's very not broad. only a bunch of species, but it's like a bunch of genera, right? So we have all these different kinds of animals. So we, we have talked a lot about it. I think our goal will be to get the small animal and large animal questions out. And then I think once that project is done, our hope is to maybe convene a group of folks who could maybe pick some specific species and, and maybe start to look at the evidence um, as it can be applied to those species. It's really challenging, right? Because a bird is not a rabbit, is not a ferret, is not a guinea pig, is not a hamster. Um, there are just so many different species. Um, but if we could pick some of them, hopefully we can start to answer some of the big questions for those guys. Yeah. Um, ever since my fabulous story about the greyhound hating me, we've had a couple of questions about ambi bags. Um, especially kind of, is it worth as a practice buying an ambi bag to assist with ventilation before intubating? Um, you. Yeah, I was just typing an answer to that, but I'll oh, <laughs> beat <laughs> I you to it. it. By, I can um, answer it by uh, orally then. Um, unfortunately, um, I, we don't have strong evidence, but I, uh, the general thought is that those um, bag mask valves probably don't make a good enough seal in dogs and cats to actually deliver a good breath. So we do still recommend at this point, and we'll see what the answers out of the next round come to, but um, at the end of the first round of the guidelines, uh, we came to the conclusion that really mouth to snout is probably the best you can do, that a, a, a bag mask valve is probably not gonna work. Regardless of if the patient is not intubated, regardless of whether you use a bag mask valve or mouth to snout ventilation, you still have to pause chest compressions. You can't use a bag if they're not intubated and do compressions and ventilation simultaneously. So I don't know that it buys you anything. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, it, without the ability to get a good seal because of the fur, it's unlikely that they're gonna help you until, before the patient's intubated. So I'm gonna move on a little bit um, to my personal favorite topic of all, of all the world, which is um, auditing. <laughs> So, um, Rachel, you um, may be able to help on this. So I can personally see an, not an issue with auditing the use of the guidelines. Obviously, you can kind of audit how many people um, are aware of the guidelines and that know the guidelines within practice. Um, but what about an outcome audit when it comes to CPR? Can you, can you really do that within practice um, if there are so many kind of different variables on a success, if that makes sense. I, I think yes, you can. I, my understanding is that you, um, the recovery guidelines have some sheets that you could fill in as well to gather feedback. Is that right? So I think, yeah, I think you need to, I think the chat about how things have gone at the end, definitely. But I think it's also worth looking at what went on. So even down to things, I know we were saying like, where is the equipment? It's like, have you got the stuff in in your crash box ready can people know where your crash box is i know i've gone in situations where i move into different clinics and some it's obvious it's the big red box in others if you work there when it was put in that box you might know what it is but does it isn't so i think there's many different aspects of it that you could actually audit that would probably have a a big effect on the outcome without necessarily having to you know audit every did it live did it die i think there's many other parts of it as well because i think sometimes People get put off the auditing because it seems such a massive, great big thing. And then you end up with all this data and it's like, now what do I do with all this data? So I think my advice would be to start with something smaller that could make a bigger impact. But again, keeping a record of what you did and filling in the sheets that the recover have to give the feedback is obviously highly beneficial. And even auditing, a common one is, um, you know, are your emergency drugs even in date? Because they get used sometimes so infrequently that, you know, before you know it, they can go out of date. And that there's still the correct con um, concentration that matches up with your drug and dosing chart. Um, so many drugs are changing now, it seems. Um, generics are changing some concentrations. I know there've been some atropine and adrenaline um, uh, 
vials that come out of you can't get the concentration you're used to. So just making sure you're verifying that that's matching up with your do dosing chart. And I'll put a plug in for having a drug and dosing chart. I think it's really important to not have to do any math during CPR. Um, that you have way too much of a cognitive load. So um, whether you use the recover dosing chart or you make your own um, based on your local protocols, um, I would really encourage you to have a chart that has weight and then the mills, the amount of the volume of drug you want to draw up. No one should have to do calculations yeah. during CPR. And that's even helpful on um, kind of pre-anesthetic che checklists and um, just making sure that no matter what the procedure, you've you've already worked out the emergency drugs because I don't know, well, I don't know about everyone else, but my maths at the best of time isn't accurate. <laughs> and if there's something, you know, lots of people screaming that something needs CPR, I'm not going to be able to work out, um, you know, a mig per mil dosage at all. Um, so introducing that into your pre-anesthetic checklists um, is something that's really important and really beneficial and just saving that time um, can save a lot of lives as well and auditing whether those are actually um, filled in as well. So, you know, you might put it on your anesthetic checklist, but everyone might just ignore it and just, you know, push it to the wayside, which then you might think you're doing okay, but you're actually not so um, auditing whether people are doing those um sorry there's a there's a big question about a defibrillator um yeah it looks like it's a question about the defibrillator safety yeah 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 it's a good it's a really important um question about um how to safely use the defibrillator so um my classic line for this is remember the goal of electrical defibrillation is to stop the heart so you don't want to be anywhere near a live person with a defibrillator because there's a risk that you stop that person's heart um so the question it looks like was about using gloves um and there are mm -hmm. there are definitely people who advocate for the use of gloves um keep in mind as, as an insulator um to hopefully prevent you from being shocked um and i understand why you would want to do that. Um, I think uh, it can maybe give you a false sense of security. Remember that if you're doing defibrillation correctly, you're putting a lot of gel on the hand paddles and then you're pushing into the fur to try to make contact. And if in the course of doing that, that gel happens to go down your glove and hit your hand and you have a contact between the paddle and your hand, you could still shock yourself. So just remember that just because you're wearing gloves doesn't mean you don't want to check and make sure of all of that. In human medicine, and this this is about the um, European Resuscitation Council guidelines, also keep in mind that in people, they very rarely are using hand paddles to defibrillate these days. They're mostly using automated electric defibrillators with patches um, because people aren't quite as hairy as our patients, at least not all of them. Um, our patients' patches are unlikely to work because of the fur and the time it would take to shave them to put patches on is precious time that you should be doing chest compression so we don't recommend that so we do still recommend using the hand paddles and the gel the conducting gel so you just want to be very very careful that you are not touching that there's not a bridge touching you you're not touching the table none of your um, none of your co-workers are touching the patient either because uh, you can certainly hurt someone with a defibrillator i think that's something as well if you do have a defibrillator my goodness, I can't say that word. I'm just going to say defib. <laughs> Don't worry, I couldn't say veterinarian, so <laughs> you're okay. And um, I'm going to say defib and pretend I'm in Grey's Anatomy. Um, if you have a defib in practice, um, especially, um, you know, this stimulation training, it might be that you have used one in practice, but you don't use one for so long. And the safety aspect of things is really important because you don't want to have the animal survive, but you'd be dead on the floor. <laughs> essentially um, yeah if you have a defibrillator in your practice um, no one should touch it unless they've been trained um, and it's another reason to think about doing drills every few months at least just walking through all those steps and walking through safe use of the defibrillator it's a dangerous piece of equipment and it should not be in any practice where people aren't trained you need to be trained get a lot of the um you know the automatic defib defibs um that are obviously in most practices um, just for person safety. I have no idea if they're able to be used on animals or not. I don't know if anyone knows. Yeah, so interestingly, so um, I guess something that it would be nice for folks to know is that um, you know the, the online courses and the certification process, there's a fee associated with that and that, that money comes back to the American College of Veterinary and Emergency and Critical Care 
to support recover programs. So that's what's allowing us to do the next round of guidelines, some administrator support there. But part of that money goes to research grant every year. Um, and the research grant that was funded for 2020 was actually is actually looking at this question, the use of automated electric defibrillators in dogs. It would not be recommended in cats ever because they're so small. And remember that these are devices that are meant to be used mm -hmm. on adult humans. And so the, the dosing would be too high for a cat. Um, but they're doing this study right now looking at whether it accurately, um, so the automated electric defibrillators decide based on the ECG whether the patient should be shocked or not and then shocks them. And so the question is, will it work in dogs? Um, and how long does it take to actually get those patches on in a furry dog compared to a person? So those are the questions they're trying to answer in the research grant that was funded this year. So, um, so I don't know yet. I've always, I've always said that if, if, the, if, if you've got one and you can get the patches on and it's a medium to large breed dog, it may be worth a shot, but we just have no idea whether those internal algorithms actually work for dog ECGs. Um, so, um, it's a little bit dicey right now, I would say, but hopefully we'll have some answers to that in the next year. Yeah, I'm really excited for that. <laughs> that <laughs> sounds amazing. Um, so for all those who are asking for links um, for the courses, we will post up links um, afterwards so that you can click straight through to them. I know a lot of people are posting links, um, but we'll put them on an actual post so they're a bit easier to find for you. Um, and they'll also be on the web page underneath um, this video. And we have actually come up um, very close to eight o'clock, so we are going to have to wrap this up um, for the evening. Um, but I'd like to thank everyone for engaging with us this evening, everyone from all over the world. I'm, I'm just so excited to um, read where everyone's come from and really honoured that you have got up at all sorts of different times to listen to us um, kind of just chat about something that we're all so passionate about. Um, and thank you to Dan, Ken and Rachel for joining us um, this evening slash today. If any of you would like more information on what we have discussed this evening, um, then you can visit the RCVS Knowledge website or the Recover Initiative website. Um, as I said, all the links that I can think of, I will put on our website underneath this video so that they're all easy to grab. Um, and the video, as well as the um, one that we recorded beforehand, will be on both our Facebook page and our website. Um, and just to let all those know that if you have already implemented CPR guidelines or use simulation training at all, then please apply to the Knowledge Awards um, and have the opportunity to share your methods um, and skills with the rest of the profession. Um, and again, I will put a link up to that. Um, but thank you so much. And thank you, Dan, Ken and Rachel. And um, good night, everyone. This this is again where I don't even know how to stop the live. Sorry, guys. <laughs>